I, I'm really delighted to, to have Joe Kayser here because I think Siemens uh, represents sort of the quintessential global company uh, uh, operating in this environment of rising nationalism. Uh, uh, Joe told me earlier that Siemens employs more people than Apple, Facebook, Microsoft, and Ooh. Google combined. So, uh, and they're pretty much spread all over the world. <clears throat> uh, so, Joe, you wrote a piece uh, recently talking about the five great challenges uh, that the world faces that I think is a good jumping off point for this conversation. First one, rise of populism. Talk about why that's important to Siemens. Well, I mean, I was talking about the five big challenges which we see in the next decade, sort of, so to speak. And the first one, obviously, was raising populism. And that raising populism naturally leads to nationalism. Nationalism leads to protectionism. And then, you know, off we go with a global trade uh, and global order. So that's the concern. And then if you look at the other four, which I think go together, second, for example, climate change, it's just fact that we have it. It was a very interesting panel we just had about electrification and how to do it. 70 million people <clears throat> are currently on the rise in terms of migration being number three. And they migrate because, first of all, they want to have a better life, or they're fleeing from war and terror, or they need to deal with climate change. So it goes all together. And the fourth one now is the fourth industrial revolution, the, what people call the Internet of Things, or in other words, the Internet now reaching the industrial world. Uh, and then now comes together with nationalism and protectionism versus the fourth industrial revolution, which is nothing than an extraterritorial system without any borderlines in terms of free flow of data. So the, Things like that. The, the fourth industrial revolution forces you to be global in... in Absolutely. Reality. I mean, this is what, what the whole matter is all about. The internet is a global thing. Now, the internet reaches the industrial world. So we have 470 factories all over the world. I want to know what's going on in those factories. Compare them with each other. You know, design products and solutions in the what we call the digital twin in the virtual world and then bring it back into those factories. So I need to have access real time to any place, anywhere, any time in the world. Item number five, and that goes together now because this matter of force industrial revolution is about innovation. This is about a long-term way of dealing with a divided world, which on one hand cuts out the middleman and makes the products and solutions cheaper. On the other hand, there's gonna be a, a lot of jobs being lost and more being created. So I need to have more time to address that matter. And here comes the fifth point, which is you know, the massive increase of short-termism. Every quarter, every month, you know, people are saying, tell me what the pe where the penny is. Or uh, last, just a few months ago, I was on a podium and we talked about you know, how to address those matters on industrial revolution. And I said, well, we need to retrain our people. We need to do more on education. We need to show people what the connectivity is between the real world, the physical world of products and goods, and the virtual world of designing in the space. And I said we are, we are spending about $600 million every year on education and training our people so that they be employable. And then someone told me, what are actually your shareholders saying if you waste $600 million of their money? Well. If they don't like it, they can sell the shares. It's not a prison. But that's a courageous statement. Obviously, I don't need to tell you. But that's where all the five challenges come together. And at the end of the day, you need to be competitive. You need to outperform your peers. And then you can you know, take that policy. It, it, it's really a good framework to, to, to think about the very difficult situation that large companies are in today. So you have. Uh, climate change and the fourth industrial revolution, which are almost forcing you to take a global view. But then you have populism and uh, migration that are causing rising nationalism, protectionism, incredible tension there. Uh, need to focus on the long term, but shareholders focusing on the short term. So how do you solve that puzzle? How do you navigate uh, uh, 
between those forces. Well, I believe that's the biggest uh, task and the responsibility of leadership of our time. That's in essence what it is. It's relatively simple to make good on Wall Streets or Frankfurt's or London's or what have you, Shanghai's expectations. You know, you guide and then you do something and you better be good in what you do. That's a simple task. But then, you know, having this massive migration of uh, workforce, there are going to be hundreds of, there are millions of jobs being lost and there's going to be more millions of jobs being created. But Unfortunately, those ones who lose the job might be different in terms of qualification of what is being needed. So we need to proactively help them get retrained and secure their employability, not necessarily at Siemens, but in the industry. And, uh, and so we need to balance uh, all those competing arguments together. Worst one obviously being the, the nationalism topic as a global company. Now, in the past, people would have said that retraining challenge that you, that massive retraining challenge that you just referred to, is, was something, would be something to be solved by governments. You, you, can't, you can't take that solution. No, and I won't, because governments should not uh, honestly you know, do the job for the companies. Nor, you know, because uh, governments need to set the framework, and we as global companies need to find our way to deal with national boundaries which governments have. Governments have boundaries, territorial boundaries. This is where the law applies. This is where you need to secure your people with. So it's a different interest than a global company which has its customers all over the world. So at the, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I do believe that global companies, no matter who it is and what they do, as long as they serve society, which I believe is very important, the task of companies is to serve society. If, if companies don't serve society, they should not exist because they don't have a purpose. But if those companies have a purpose because they make life better for people and, uh, you know, and, 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 and defeat cancer, then they need to go out and take the task of integrating the world because governments cannot do it. And every day we see that be it the United States, be it Germany, be it Saudi Arabia, every day there is a new issue, you know, which puts the responsibility on the line. So let's talk about some of those specific issues because that's a huge burden you're putting on the shoulders of global companies. So I wouldn't say it's a burden. I think it's quite a responsibility which it's worthwhile fighting for. Yeah, so let's take a couple of examples. Uh, uh, Iran is a good one. You were very involved on the, under the terms of the Iran agreement. Siemens got very involved in Iran, and then all of a sudden, the U.S. comes along and, and pulls the rug out from under you. Says you can't do that anymore. Well, look, um, <clears throat> that's, that's a very good example. There was a good and a bad thing. There was a, a global agreement about doing something together to solve the issue, and there was a unilateral bailout, right or wrong. I think that needs to be fully accepted. What I believe is a concern is that this unilateral bailout, right or wrong, but it's, you know, it's uh, the good right of any nation, that this nation then demands all, everybody else to say, I don't want you, you know, to stay in because if you do, I'm going to close down my country. That's a very... You, you ba they basically said, you have to get out or you can't do business in the U.S. That's in essence what it is. That's what it has been. So now, now comes the battle between your interests and your values. The, <laughs> so value is a great thing. It's a big word. It's a very big word. We hardly can make good on it. But then there's interests. And interests create jobs and interests keep jobs. Values don't. So we have, we've got 22 billion revenues in the United States, US dollars, and 600 in Iran. So what do you think? You go with the US. What do you think? <laughs> was not exactly the question. And so that's uh, where you have the balance to strike between value, morale, and interests uh, of what you need to protect. And that makes it awfully complicated, but that's what leadership is all about. Well, uh, well here's, here's another one. I mean, you were probably more involved or as involved with the Belt and Road Initiative in China as any Western company, maybe more involved than any, any Western company. Um, that's true. 
uh, and and I, I think the, the Belt and Road Initiative is, it looks to me like an example to tie up the rest of the world except the United States. Well, the jury is out on what's going to be tied up or not. I think that makes it so interesting, dangerous, challenging, opportunistic. We just don't know. The, there's quite a story, and I don't want to take all the time. The One Belt, One Road Initiative was founded actually on the purpose of uh, taking over capacities out of China into associated countries. When, when China got stuck in the middle between you know, breaking up to new shores, uh, high tech and what have you, and the old economy of things like steel, cement, shipbuilding, mining, they massively failed. They called it supply chain reform, very nice uh, way of putting bare-bone restructuring. When they failed at the supply chain reform in the 12th five years plan, they said, okay, fine, I cannot do restructuring because that may impact my political leadership stability. Why not, you know, going global and actually export my infrastructure to the adjacent hmm. countries? Very yeah. good or bad, very smart. So what happens now? In the meantime, they have 90 countries signed up, 90, 9 zero around the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative. It's got to be financed with two trillion US dollars to do that. So what they achieve is two things. First, strategically, they get the land route towards the west, which they need to have because the South China Sea may or may not work forever. So it's strategic interest. So probably 20 or 30% of the two trillion is actually strategic defense. The other thing is, that with those 90 countries, they unite almost 70% of the global population. 70% of the global wow. population. So whether we like it or not, we better take it seriously because infrastructure correlates with the amount of people on the planet. Healthcare does. Everything, in a way, at the end does. So if we, if we sit here in Europe, by the way, and say, oh, well, you know, it's, uh, it's just another way of conquering countries that make them dependent. Yeah, maybe, maybe, but then you have them dependent. I, is it a good thing or a bad thing? That you're, you're essentially, I've, I've heard you say elsewhere that you're essentially creating a replacement for the WTO, that the Belt and Road Initiative will become the new world order. Well, I'm, uh, that was not meant to be positive, nor was it meant to be negative. It is just <laughs> about describing a fact. If you sort of control 70% of the global population, which is probably, 50% of global trade, then you better take that seriously. That's what I'm saying. So what does that take for Siemens? Because now this was geopolitics and stuff, yeah. not exactly my primary task. But you need to understand it in order to act properly, I believe. So what do we do? Well, obviously, you know, in those 90 countries which the Chinese uh, um, companies and, and government is going to provide infrastructure and financing to in all those 90 countries. Siemens has already been there more than 50 years, for the most part 100 years. That means whenever Chinese companies come and say, I go help you with infrastructure, they need a partner who is local. They need a partner who those people trust and who is then later on able to do the services and the integration of solution, and that's us. So actually, we pretty much benefit from that, and in the meantime, we have signed up 110, 110 Chinese companies who work with us on the Belt and Road Initiative because they know Siemens is a well-established brand. They are in those countries. They have sales force. They have service, and they can integrate the different interests of infrastructure. Uh, uh, another more recent example is what's going on in Saudi Arabia and the questions around the, uh, the disappearance of the uh, uh, journalists. Yeah. Uh, I know Saudi Arabia is another important market to you. Let me ask you, are you going to the investment forum next week? Honestly, I haven't made up my mind yet, but I need to. Uh, it's, uh, it, this is a, a, a very serious topic where you actually cannot win. You cannot win. There is a person missing. And there is, you know, and that person entered the Saudi Arabian embassy and obviously didn't return. So there is a massive concern. Um, on the other hand, if we, if we skip communicating with countries where people are missing, 
I just can't stay home because I cannot talk to anybody anymore. <laughs> so that's the other side of the story. I truly do believe no matter whether I go or not, I need to seriously think about this and make a decision tomorrow or the day after. The more I think about it, the more I believe that if you want to change something, you need to talk to people and not about people. And you need to have a say on the table. So you need to be there and address the concern. And if I go, 50-50, if I go, I am going to address the speak up in this country. Because I do want my people, it's thousands of people who work there, I do want my people to be able to speak up and speak their mind. You know, that gets to uh, uh, a, I, I'm glad you raised that because it gets to another really interesting issue that we're going to talk about in a later panel about the changing role of the CEO. You have spoken up. You actually have a pretty active Twitter account these days uh, uh, and have spoken up uh, uh, against uh, German uh, nationalist groups and otherwise. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I suspect that's different than your predecessors over the 171 years of of Siemens history, that you feel a need as a CEO today to be uh, uh, more clear-spoken on social and political issues? Well, it's a dangerous ground, obviously. Milton Friedman, who you all know in the 70s, it's a Nobel Prize uh, laureate, um, he said the business of business is business. In other words, you get your job done, you deliver your number, and, uh, and take care of your company, and that's all you do, and just stay out of trouble, right? Uh, I don't think that this is uh, good enough anymore. I do believe, uh, do believe you have a responsibility to speak up. And in the case of the German topic on uh, where I said, you know, I'd rather have, uh, uh, you know, people with headscarves than people who, you know, join Nazi uh, organizations, it's got not, nothing to do with my, with, with my country. I love my country. I'm a German. I'm proud to be a German. But, you know, we need to learn from our past. You just cannot say, oh, well, you know, you know it was some, some person. We need to speak up. And if people are talking racism, if they talk about, you know, dividing by race, I'm out of this. And I, you know, and I tell people that's not what I want. Not in my country not what I want and uh, not in my company. You, you've got a room full of people here who are having to navigate the same global cross currents that you are maybe not quite at the same scale you do. Uh, do you have advice for them on how to, uh, to get through this complicated world that we're in today? Well, there's nothing worse than an unasked advice, uh, obviously, <laughs> uh, because we get them every day. But, but, um, but I asked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> look, um, there is a balance to strike between your interests and your values. And this is a balance nobody else than you can actually do. You can listen to our comms departments, we can listen to our, you know, our, our, our national CEOs, we are doing business in 203 countries in the world. At the end of the day, it's us who take the stand. And we, and CEO, to me, is not chief entertainment officer. This is about carrying the flag and say, this is where we are going. I'm the first man or woman, hopefully as soon, you know, to carry that flag and take responsibility. And if it goes wrong, I'm the first one to be affected by it and take the consequences. That's what I believe is leadership all about. And we need to set those examples in a time where a lot of people just look for the greater good of their own rather than the others. Joe Kayser, great advice. Thank you for being with us. Thank you.